Hi, everyone. Stephen Van Tassel here, wildlife control consultant with another episode of Living the Wildlife with the Pesky Podcast family. Well, we have today Dr. Tim Hiller. We don't get too many PhDs on this program, so we're really going to get geeky today with you, everybody. So he is Dr. Tim, T- Tim Hiller, Executive Director of the Wildlife Ecology Institute based here in Helena, Montana, but we don't hold that against him being in Helena, because that is the capital of our of our great state. Um, kind of pretty, you know, but it could be could be worse. I guess if you get out of the city, it gets prettier. But uh, anyways, it's a, we're glad to have you here, Tim. Welcome to the Pest Geek Podcast. Thanks for having me. Well, tell us a little about yourself. Of course, we, we, we'd go back to the uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln when you were a postdoc there. So uh, tell us about, about your organization and what you're doing. Yeah. So uh, soon after doing my postdoc, um, I left that position and worked for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife as their fur bear carnivore coordinator. So I was uh, immersed in a lot of different um, topics, a lot of controversial topics included within there, as you can imagine, with Western carnivores and also with fur bears and trapping and such. Um, That was a, a great experience. Certainly having the management perspective has made me a much better researcher. Um, when I left that position, I went back into academic research. And between those two positions, it, and even before then, I really started to get a little um, disappointed with some of the research coming out of academia. And so, um, you know, their their merit system is based off publisher parish and, and, and you know, high impact theoretical journals and all that sort of thing. I'm a very um, down to earth kind of guy, you know, applied research and stuff like that. What can we use? What can managers use? So that's kind of where, you know, the impetus behind me looking into what can I do about this? So in 2015, um, I, for lack of a better way to put it, I got fed up and I took the plunge, um, you know, have a, had a couple of kids late in life, but, you know, got a young family and, and took the plunge and took the risk. And here we are five years later working on, you know, a lot of different projects, including fur bear related ones um, and couldn't be happier. And we, we continue to gain a lot of traction, I'm happy to say. So I think the next couple of years are going to be pretty darn good for us, too. Yeah, so just to sort of help our audience, so you are a nonprofit organization that is contracted out by state agencies, primarily, I would suspect, to do research on their behalf to answer certain questions that they need to have answered for their management goals. Does that sound about right? right? Yep, that sounds right. Um, A lot of state agencies, some federal work, we do some endangered species work, for example, black-footed ferrets. Yeah. Um, So we work with a lot of agencies. We do work with some with other NGOs. Um, we work with some selected um, like-minded academics um, to help fill in some gaps that we may have on certain projects. So it's, it's pretty well-rounded. We're all about partnerships and, mm-hmm. and uh, especially with state agencies, since that's been you know a strong background of mine as far as you know, what do you need and working at them from beginning to end of the project to make sure everything's going the way it should. So what's, what sparked my interest in uh, having you on the show was that you were doing some research in Indiana, as I, as I recall, on gray fox. And it seems that uh, there's not a lot known about gray fox, it seems, when you compare it with how much research is done on other species. So uh, what exactly are you doing out there? Well, it's really interesting. Um, so gray foxes are distributed throughout much of uh, you know the continental United States, except the northern Rocky Mountains. There there are no gray foxes in Montana, for example. Um, they get on you know they're over in Oregon where I was on the west side and, and stuff like that. So the, the biggest concern in the Midwest is well all the landscape change right that was that looked very different you know a couple hundred years ago. Mm. Um, I mean Indiana in 1800 you know we think it had around 20 million acres of forest. Um, it's a, you know, the whole state's 23 million acres. Wow. Before. It was almost all forested. Then, the, you know, 100 years later, 1900, we think it had about 1.5 million. So that's a loss of, a substantial loss of forest. Then we come back around to today and, it, you know, it bumped up maybe around 5 million, but that's still a, a huge land use change. Right. And that's even more prevalent in some other, you know, Midwestern states. So the gray fox being um, 
a species that relies on kind of woody, brushy structure and, and such um, doesn't do well in, you know, intensive, extensive agricultural areas. It's really starting to hit the radar um, these past couple of years. So that was kind of the impetus to the Indiana DNR um, and a couple other agencies. We had multiple conversations and we got this project up and going in Indiana. So why does the gray fox need that type of cover? Is it for safety to keep from getting killed by coyotes or is it a prey base issue? Does anybody know? That's a good question there. So what, what can a gray fox do that no other canid, at least in the United States can do? Well, they climb, they climb trees. Okay. Yep. And so they've evolved to do so to escape and you know, with the land use changes in Indiana, we, we think that the gray fox is the only native canid in Indiana. You know, the coyotes and the red foxes moved in after settlement. So um, they, they're much smaller than these other canid species. Really? And, uh, yeah. And they, you know, I mean, they, as we've talked about, they climb trees probably primarily to escape. And so there's all these factors going on. Um, undoubtedly, habitat loss and fragmentation is going to be a, a part of it, but you know, what's it mean that coyotes have moved in? Are coyotes, you know, directly killing a lot of them? Are they directly competing with coyotes and red foxes? What happens with bobcats starting, you know, population recovery in the Midwest? Um, raccoons are everywhere now. So is canine distemper becoming a problem because they serve as a reservoir um, for that sort of disease? Um, there's a lot of different issues going on. So we're trying to disentangle that. And to do a good job at it, uh, this is just a phenomenal project in scope simply because nothing, I'm not aware of any gray fox project that's anywhere near this big. This would be a big project for white-tailed deer or, you know, a more popular species. So, so what are you doing? Are you doing just a population census and you're just trying to do a lot of trapping with what do you use? Are you trapping? Are you using cameras? How are you evaluating population densities? Well, the first thing we're doing is we've got, so we've got two study sites, one in the central part of the state that's mostly ag and private land. And then down south near Kentucky, we've got another study site, you know, multiple counties that's mo- mostly forested still, has a better population of gray foxes undoubtedly and some public land. So we're looking at things like um, survival, what's affecting survival, um, reproduction, habitat use, diseases, parasites, and we're even collecting genetic information to say to, to look at okay are these individuals in the central part of the state and elsewhere are they are they isolated from other you know the southern mm-hmm. population so this involves you know so many factors involved um, we are doing captures so okay um, first and foremost we're relying on trappers so okay. the trapping season obviously is underway right now so if a trapper um, in either of those two study sites one you know in central or the southern southern part of the state, captures a, a gray fox and for example you know it's, it's almost surely going to be a foothold at least most of the time so mm-hmm. if they capture one we've got a hotline number and i'm happy to share that um they give us a, they give us a call and we are one of our two or both of our field ecologists that are stationed there in indiana go out and immediately process it so that means they um sometimes the trappers moved it to a cage trap and or something like that which is great and so we we drug it we put a gps collar on it and we collect blood and tissue samples and wow. measurements and all kinds of things for, you know, everything from genetics to disease surveillance, um, we let the fox go. And then, then we start collecting location data from that collar. And we can also even collect, um, you know, we can tell if that fox, well, we can tell from the signal on the collar if the collar hasn't moved for four hours or more. So that either means the fox is dead or the collar has fallen off and is, hasn't moved. So, oh, so even they even move when they're sleeping then? More than once per four hours, yeah. No kidding, yeah. okay. So, so the, is this a satellite? Is it satellite or you have to go out with the wand and I mean the antenna to, to find where they are? The, well, we don't have satellite, cap- satellite download capabilities for a collar that small yet. You can get them for okay. bobcats now, that's becoming right. more popular. But we so we have what's called uh it's kind of the traditional VHF system where yeah. you can get a signal um, and then do it from different spots um, to triangulate. But we Triangle. we only use it to monitor for mortality because if that collar hasn't moved for four hours or more, it'll put off a faster instead of going beep 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 it'll go beep 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 beep. 
then we follow that signal in with the directional antenna walk in um so we have to get you know permission if it's on private land of course All right um but it's a it's really a gps collar that collects data from from satellite positions right so it records okay. those data on board and we have what's called a base station which is really just a really small almost smartphone sized unit with an antenna on it so once we get a VHF signal, we know we're getting close to within range, and then we can switch over to this UHF or ultra high frequency system, and it pulls the data off the collars. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, so, yeah. you're able to, so you don't have to get the collar in, in your possession to get the data off, you can extract it. Oh, right. very nice. How long does the battery last? Um, it depends on how many, um, how you set the collar up as far as when the VHF is active, how many locations you're taking per day, how often it retries, if it's cloudy cover, the box is underground. We've got about a year's worth of uh, data we can collect. I believe we've got it on every seven hour rotation. So every okay. seven hours it's attempting to take a, uh, a okay. So, So given the lawsuit, happy world we live in, uh, is this, do you have to, or is that something that affects how you're, your, your design of this research is this are you going to be worried about certain recommendations to the state that all of a sudden the animal rights people are going to sue and you have to be sure your data is rigorous enough to withstand court even though that doesn't matter anymore as we found with the grizzly bear um data doesn't seem to matter anymore so i don't so what do you do you just simply have something that's defensible and move on yeah and so our job really is to provide you know the data in, a, in the best format using contemporary statistical techniques and, and, and interpretations so that we give the state agency the best leg to stand on so that their decisions are informed and defensible. And, you know, it's, it's hard when you've got these social and political challenges associated with something like that. You know, we're, we're focused on the, on the ecological side. Um, right. what, what recommendations can we make um, as far as, say, forest management? Um, but... You're right. You're totally right. Once it once it becomes, you know, a peer reviewed publication and that sort of thing, um, in my mind, it's it's kind of difficult. Not impossible. It's kind of difficult to challenge some of the stuff once it's made it through that rigorous process. Mm. But again, that's not necessarily geared towards all that social and political. No, you know, no, you're point. just you're, and nor in that necessarily nor should it be because you don't want to. I mean, the data is ultimately going to be what the data is, uh, what you do with it. But do you think that? So, a couple of questions I want to ask here about your information. So, have you found any preliminary findings that you thought were interesting about what you're seeing so far? Is everything what you're expecting? What are you learning about the the gray fox that you didn't know before? That's a good question. Um, we literally, in the central study area, just colored three foxes last week, and we haven't had any location downloads. And okay. even so, it'd be just a handful, right? Yeah. Um, the southern area, we haven't really had any surprises that I can think of, and we're still waiting to get some disease, you know, and genetics results back from the lab. So it's it's really early to tell. Having said that, um, there's two things I'll note, and again, this is very pr preliminary. Right, we won't hold you to it. It's not a. We just want <laughs> gut reactions here. That's all we got in our in our industry. So we won't hold you to it. So, so all of these foxes um, have been captured in foothold traps. Um, okay, and I believe two have been hind foot captured, and the rest have been front foot captured. And this this includes coyote sized foothold traps. Oh. So these, you know, that's a that's a big trap for a little gray fox. It would be, yeah. And so far, we we've had one um, one mortality that we think is capture related, associated with that. It was a hind foot capture, which we expect not to be. Um, you know, we expect more risk associated with a hind foot capture because a gray fox is just a lot more active in a trap than a red fox or a coyote or that sort of thing. Um, generally speaking, so. But we've had six that, you know, they're all apparently doing just fine. And we, you know, we haven't um, taken any extra precautions. We processed them as if they were caught in a cage trap or, or something like that. You know, the, the cage trap isn't foolproof, but as you well know. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Any stretch of the imagination. Um, so, so that's been really interesting. Another thing is um, on some very preliminary data we've had um, from one fox, and it's it really seems to be sticking with stream corridors. Um, so these are riparian areas that have cover. You know, again, not a big surprise, but um, 
you know, something you would expect and something consistent with what we, what we had expected. Sure. So, and do you, are you getting data on the types of footholds being used? Do you ever ask the trapper to, to, I know it's post hoc. I mean, it would be post hoc data, right? But are you sort of collecting that to see if for, to add to the BMP side of things to see if there is a modification to some of those coyote traps that could be done to make it a little less impactful on the, on the gray fox? That, that is an excellent question. Um, the answer is yes. I put together, so I put together a form for trappers to receive their payments, um, $75 per fox. That we, wow. That we capture and call it a release. Yes. So it's, that, it's, a, it's, that, a, it's a, that good motivates thing. them. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, yes, you know, I, I actually updated the forms. I ended up contacting the first, the folks related with the first four captures, like, I want to know what types of footholds these folks are using. Very good. Yeah. And they're using high quality footholds, even, you know, for the, including the coyote traps. So these are, you know, like uh, MB 550s. And, yeah. and I think there was one MB 450 in there. So I'm still waiting on some of, to hear what some of the others are. And I added that in and asked my field ecologists get, get the specific information because we, we might be able to do something. So some jaw lamination because the MB 550 has some jaw lamination. So you wonder if that re will reduce, spread that, that strike over a little bit larger area for them. Are they offset too? Is there an offset on those M MB 550s? I, yes. The ones, so. I know the ones that they mentioned were, I'm not, I think they make a standard jaw MB 550, okay. but these were offsets. Interesting. And, are they allowed to take, are they allowed to capture a gray fox in Indiana or is these incident, incidental takes? They are. They, they are they, incidental. Yep, yep. Until we have solid information that, you know, to provide to the Indiana DNR, um, to my knowledge, they're not going to enact any regulated. regulated oh, so, so, they're, so they're protected right now, essentially. The, well, they're, they're regulated as, as, similar to if they were a red fox, for example. So they're the, the season okay. on them, et cetera. Um, okay. But the interesting thing, too, is that uh, literally this week, late last week, we had um, all of our 20 years of BMP data come out in a, in a wildlife monograph published by the Wildlife Society. So yes. This is, a, this is a big a big deal for the trapping world and the research world because that's a good thing to rely on when you're putting together a research project showing that these traps have met international humane trap testing standards. Oh, really? So Europe accepted it? Well, they accept they accepted those international standards yeah. decades ago. So we'll, okay, <laughs> all right. Well, okay. We'll, we'll see what that remains to be seen as far as. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we 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 know it's likely more more due to uh, protectionism under the guise of humaneness, but we won't say that out loud here on our. That would be <laughs> that would besmirch the character of our European friends. So um, there is uh, anyway. It's a, the opinion of of some of us. Anyways, it just some of it just smelled a little fishy the way these rules went down with their you know backing all these muskrats in the netherlands you know it's so, mm -hmm. uh, so i just find it interesting how uh, not the rules are different for people that aren't us so in, in any event but i i digress um okay. so it, what is it your uh, is there a particular research question that is uh specifically I intriguing you or is this really just you're doing basic trying to get the lay of the land research and just sort of see what comes at you. You know, you're out there in the woods, trap, having stuff trapped and all right, what, what do we extract from this material? Right. And, and, and so it sounds like we're throwing the kitchen sink at it. And, okay. and that's, that's not totally untrue because there have, you know, there hasn't been any comprehensive gray box project like this. Like I mentioned, there's, there's bits and pieces here and there, a lot, you know, no information in a lot of states, especially Midwestern. So you can't, it, it's so hard to compile it. And, you know, even now we think that, you know, a line going through the middle of the United States based off of, you know, uh, you know, glaciation and all that from the past that we, there's some pr preliminary work that a colleague, Dr. Don Renning at Luther College is doing that she's going to publish to where it looks like there is a, an eastern gray fox that might be considered as a different species from the western gray fox based off of genetic information that she's put together. And she's, she's one of our project partners. She's really uh, using her genetic expertise and we're all learning the disease side of things. None of us I consider a disease ecologist. And then um, we also have Jerry Ann Albers from Indiana DNR, the fur bear biologist who's 
obviously a, a, an integral component to the project, all, all full partners on this. So. so how many years is this study um, planned for? This is three years in the field and then one year of data analysis. So it's, wow, this it's is a, a big study. Holy yeah, cow. Yeah, it would have, it would have made for you know, a, a PhD and a master's student if we'd gone that route. Um, but I chose to uh, really try and develop professional careers of, of early career professionals. Uh, okay. Put it around about way. So I hired a couple of folks that love field work and, and uh, they're smarter than me. They're not sitting behind a computer all the time. Right. So uh, that, that's what happens when you make a mistake like I did and, and think you need a PhD. <laughs> okay. Well, let me, so let's explore this. So you don't have any, um, you don't have any students attached to this project here. You don't have any, any PhD students. This is purely your organization. It's in it. So it's, you're not, had, so no one's degree is on the line here then with this. Exactly. That's okay. exactly right. And we'll, we'll, you know, we have one person um, who may be there for the full duration of the three years of field work. And then the other position, depending on their goals, you know, we want this to be, we, we're, we're in the business of training our future professionals, right? Right, right. And, and current professionals even for certain, certain things. So um, we're going to give them what they need and they give us what we need and we make it a, a, a great professional relationship and, uh, and keep going on. So, so this is, things. so this is some incredible data. You're going to have three years of data collecting with a year of data processing. And so that would assume all, so you're getting blood samples, you're doing disease, you're doing probably, um, swabs of the, an, of the anus, I would guess. Well, looking at their stool, you're looking at that too. Uh, yep. Yeah, so we're, that's one thing I didn't mention is we are taking fecal samples at that and stomach contents for dead foxes, fecal samples as we can for live ones. So that's a oh. another whole other component about a diet analysis using DNA. Right. So, so we can try to determine what, you know, there's pros and cons to everything with this. We can, you know, look at different types of animal matter and plant matter present and that sort of thing. So yeah, so you're not just looking at macro material. You're getting down to the DNA level, so you're not going to know exactly what's in that those stomach contents. Where's the money for this? This thing must cost a fortune. It is a big project. Um, it, it it would make, it's what's, you know, it, it's as much or more than what's sometimes spent on white-tailed deer for a project. So that is, and, and for you in the audience that doesn't know this, white-tailed deer is like the holy grail. That's what keeps a lot of your state agencies afloat. And so you don't touch white-tailed deer. In other states, it's pheasants. Uh, and so white-tailed deer is like, that's that's what keeps those departments going. And so for this level of funding, is this um, uh, Pittman-Roberts? Exactly. Funding? Non, okay. Yep, yep. So this is based off of, excise taxes on um, firearms and ammunition and that sort of thing. And uh, so, and wildlife ecology Institute, we came up with the 25% non-federal match. So that's, that's very typical. So we, we, you know, waived our indirect costs, which is our operating funds that we right, normally right. get. And um, I'm actually volunteering all my time on the project to, to get it going. Cause I, this never, this is a, you know, a, a big deal. So we weren't going to let it go. We were going to do what we needed to do. How many states do you think your data will impact? Do you, is it will it be just be the Midwest? Do you think it will, you know, like Ohio and maybe some other states that are nearby, or do you think this will have national impact in terms of how that, how how uh, analogous will the information be for other states? Well, that's a great question. I think most all if not all of the objectives associated with this project will be directly applicable to the entire midwest um there's going to be components that are going to be important throughout the u.s um there's going to be some the gray fox goes down into south america so there's going to be you know folks in, in that part of the world you know beyond the united states that's going to be interested in perhaps some of the disease components and that sort of thing as well so yeah i mean i'm just seeing uh, just off the cuff, five five publications right off the, you know, first you have just publishing the data, you the raw data you got in. Then you have the stomach content data, the D, the species analysis, home range analysis, yep. um, life cycle, probably reproductive rate, you know, where they're nesting, where, they're, where their home range is. I, I'm like, wow, this is going to be, you guys are going to be writing for a while. Yeah, a year might not be enough, but we might try and, you know, keep things going before that. Plus, we we do have a component about denning in pups. So when we 
you know, during springtime, when we have a, a cluster of points in a really tight area, we're going to go in there and look for den sites and uh, attempt to capture the pups and put trail cameras on, take some DNA samples, ear tag them and, and that sort of thing. So, and, and those types of things, that's, that's relatively novel, at least for great foxes. So we're, you know, that, that our first year is going to really be a, a pilot year for how we might try and get that done. So at 20, so it started this season, I would assume, this trapping season. So yep. we're looking at, so it would be 2021, 20, 2022, 2023, and then you start, that'd be your three years. Is that about right? I, and then I believe you, our field work ends December 2023, I believe. 23, okay. So that's, wow, that is a massive, that's a massive project. Mm-hmm. Whew. That is we, just amazing. Yeah, and, and also related to trapping, we, we are going to be, we are cage trapping as, as we can. Um, it's taken a while to secure some permits, for example, from the National Forests, Hoosier National Forest, you know, in, in that system, um, it, it, just the way it is. And, and, you know, we're waiting till after firearms deer season before we really get into that just for. Any challenges you see in the cage trapping, Gray Fox? Not compared to, you know, we we finished up, a cage trapping project on Sierra Nevada red foxes in Oregon. And, you know, most, if not all the people listening are going to know what cage trapping a red fox, at least a non-urban one might be like. But okay. Grays, um, they should, it shouldn't be near an issue with gray foxes. So what size traps are you using for that? What planning to use for that? So we've got two different styles. I've kind of got um, the less expensive, you know, 12 by 12 by whatever they are, 30 or 32, so. 32, so the raccoon size trap. Okay. Yep, yep. And that's that's from a previous project I had on kit boxes in Oregon. Yeah. And then uh, we've got a bunch of cam trip cages out of California, which um, those are, they come in a nested set of four. So they slide in, you know, um, you can carry four at a time. And they're... 36 inches deep and they vary in size from uh well they're, they're tall and they're narrow so they're made for like boxes. a cat yeah like a cat okay exactly and the you know i mean trappers are just ingenious and resourceful so that that, that was in response to some of the bands on footholds and what they talk, call body gripping traps right so right holds and conifers and stuff in california and you know those traps have gained a lot of momentum over the years so i've got quite a few of those in inventory now and we're we're using those on areas where where so, there's less chance of theft. So what are you using for bait? Well, we're starting out with some commercial baits, um, mostly gray fox oriented, um, you know, gland lure and gray fox urine and, and stuff like that. So we're going to be modifying that as we go and trying different things if we need to. But I'm, I'm not a real proponent of, uh, in general, of, okay, this bait's not working. Let's try another bait. You know, the, there's... To me, there's rarely a, this magic bait that's just going to do the trick every time. Mm-hmm. Like, that could be wrong. Yeah. Um, but we put trail cameras on these too, so we can see some of the behavior. And, you know, if we have a, we've, for example, we've got a couple cages near uh, someone's house out in the country um, because they have boxes coming in because they're throwing scraps out in the yard. Oh. Well, would, you know, what's the best thing to do um, as long as the state buys off on it is, okay, have them stop feeding the scraps at least loosely and put them in the trap. So right. you know, just quick adaptation of stuff like that. If, if it's, you know, agreeable by everybody. Yeah. I would be interested in see if, in, in whether you're noticing any type of um, refusal behavior, if the, if the Fox is feeling the cage on their feet, uh, if, if odor on the trap is becomes an issue, I would be interested in whether, you know, does one, does a trap capture better if a, if a previous fox has been in it versus not, you know, those types of mm-hmm. questions. And of course, all, always location matters. I mean, it doesn't, <laughs> if you don't have a good location, you know, you're, no fox, wasting, no there's nothing, right, you're totally <laughs> wasting your time. But I'm interested in some of those types of things, whether it works better with a cover uh, or even a two door trap is, would the, would there be less refusal if there's a, mm. you know if it's a see through like a Comstock trap and so those I don't know if anyone has answers to those questions yet. Yeah, and, you know, and I've I've tried to really minimize my biases growing up, you know, trapping over the past, you know, four well, four decades or so. Jeez, I can't believe it's been that long. But uh, you know, and 
some of these things I think might be a bit unnecessary, but we're, you know, we, we do things to try and increase capture probability, right? Because right, right. we're there to capture foxes. If we need to put dirt cover over the mesh on the wire cage, we're going to do it. We do cover it or at least put it back in some shrubs and stuff for protection from, okay. you know, whether it be, you know, raptors or predators or exposure to, you know, the elements or whatever. Right, right. So we yeah. generally just covered at least with some brush or something. Yeah. Yeah, it would just be, you know, and I think you're right. And see, my, my challenge is, is I'm so used to an urban trapping environment mm -hmm. that I, I just don't, not sure whether, because I've been talking with trappers who are, you know, Montana is not even, it's, it's not even rural, it's frontier, they're calling it. So it's, you just wonder whether, whether you're going to have a little bit more refusal with a, such a strange object, you know, in, in an urban area, they're seeing strange objects all the time, I think. So, you know, what's the difference between concrete and, and a little bit of cage, right? But in terms of out here, there's not as much concrete and, you know, the animal knows he's in an urban area versus when he's out in a farm area. And I just, I, I'm just trying to process that. And so we don't have good data, right? We have all this anecdotal stuff. We don't have any real data as to say, yeah, you know, does it matter? Does it not matter? And so I would be intrigued in some of this, some of your findings, even if it's, you know, a general sense, at least you have more data than what people have than, than their gut feelings, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's there's an interesting analogy in the fur bear world too. You know, there's there's a lot going on in the Western U.S. about beavers and translocations and restoration and and benefits for biodiversity, and that that's all great stuff. Mm -hmm. But these, you know, when the, when beavers are translocated or or moved to a new area for the purposes of restoration, they're often these problem beavers that come from urban areas. And so I've talked to quite a few folks that you know with state agencies that have been doing this. None of them have ever said that matters one bit. You take a city beaver and maybe it was never even a dam builder and you put it in a different area where it's either build a dam or, or, or die. die. Right. It, it seems like they're building dams. Building I mean, dams. They seem like, and, and, you know, the, uh, for lack of a better term, the inherent motivation of a beaver is going to be probably a little different than a great fox because yeah. they hear running water and they want to do something about it. Yeah, I would, but it's good to know that the beaver has that, you know, the instinct is so strong that mm -hmm. putting it back into a quote unquote natural environment is, it still has a chance to survive. Right. And so exactly. that's, so now the question is, is that the same for gray fox? I mean, mm -hmm. probably, I'd probably think the biggest threat for a gray fox would be cars in an, in an urban area as opposed to, <laughs> I'd be probably, that's probably the biggest thing, or maybe big dogs, I guess, would chase it probably two depending but um yeah i don't know well i'm ex i'm excited about this research i hope that everyone in the audience certainly is uh why don't you give people that phone number yes it's for indiana only folks so if you're in another state we're you know great but it's not really for that it's for people trapping in indiana who catch a a gray fox go ahead yep so the the gray fox project hotline is area code 812 Three four three eight three five zero, and that's specific to the counties of Orange, Crawford, Perry, and Harrison in the south part of the state. And in our central study site, it's uh, specific to Shelby, Bartholomew, and Decatur. Um, that doesn't mean you can't call, you know, about something else like a, a carcass. We are buying carcasses, skinned or unskinned, for twenty five dollars each. Those can come anywhere from the state. You can pick up a roadkill for us um, if it's safe to do so. You know, don't put yourself in harm's way. There you go. So it's also good for that. And within Indiana, we also have our Gray Fox observation um, system to report online. So you can go to wildlifeecology.org um, and you can go to current research. And then the very top one is our Gray Fox Project in Indiana. And you can scroll down and fill out the information there for, um, you know, if you saw one, you can give a description, contact information. We'll put it in our database. And uh, thank you very much. If you've got trail cam photos or something like that, there's a method to attach it. Um, and so all that information is very valuable. Any, any kind of, if you ask anyone who's a researcher, more data is better because 
you know, you you don't have to use it, but it's there because you sometimes think of some great things or see some patterns afterwards that, you know, you wouldn't have known otherwise. Yeah. And, and by the way, everybody, cell phone photos are great because there's GPS associated with it. So if you take a picture of a, of a gray fox with your cell phone, that can be gold because they would know exactly where you took that photo, which could be very helpful for them to model how gray fox are across the state. So this is your opportunity to do a little citizen science uh, without having to spend a whole lot, right? So you can meet, and if you pick up a road carcass, again, be careful, 25 bucks is 25 bucks. Um, and you're also contributing to a project that can really help a species we don't really know a whole lot about. And I hope that everyone, you know, uh, cares about these species because it's part of our livelihood and we should, we should enjoy these natural creatures because they're really neat and they're part of the environment that we have and we want to keep it around. That's part of our, part of our job. So, well, Dr. Hiller, we really appreciate you being with us today. Let me just give you your title again, uh, Tim Hiller, Executive Director of the, of the Wildlife Ecology Institute based in Helena, Montana. You can visit him and learn more at wildlifeecology.org. And again, for those of you out in Indiana who are encountering gray fox, definitely take some pictures. Try to help out if you see a carcass and can grab it safely. Reach out to that. Those We'll put the phone number here on the podcast as well. Thanks so much. And we would love to have you come back next year when you have some have some of that preliminary first year data to see what where things are going and what what the gray fox are telling you out there. So thank you so much for being part of the Pest Geek podcast here. I greatly appreciate it. All right. Well, everyone, this is Stephen Van Tassel, wildlife control consultant, giving you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pesky podcast. Hey, don't forget to take some time to subscribe. Also, if you have ideas for topics you'd like to have in the Pesky podcast, reach out to me at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. That's wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. And always remember, we want you to live the wildlife, not be the wildlife. Take care, everybody. 